I'll give a little bit more. We are not highly paid. We are not a million dollar operation. But what we do get, we're not under the influence of the automobile lobby, and we're not under the influence of energy interests. And I think it's clear that Jacob's is. Well, thank you. For I'll, that. I'll take exception to that. Yeah. Well, you yeah. can. The, here, here's Soon. the deal. Here's the deal. What we did is we drove our ridership model based on what is happening now, what could happen in the future, and then we compared it to facilities and systems that have been up and running for 10 years. Seattle, uh, Dallas, and Utah front runner. Mm -hmm. we, we put our model, a brand new system, up against a 10-year uh, system operating. And then we said, okay, what if we're even wrong there? And we jacked it up by 600%, okay? The sites that, that you're going to look at and that we are trying to accommodate are jacked up by 600%, okay? So that's, that's really technical terms there, I know. But what, what I'm saying to you is, is we took our best guess, increased it more, and then increased it more. So we feel very comfortable that these numbers will suffice into the future. Yes, ma'am. Is it time for a question? Yes, it may, is. May I ask a question? Yeah. Um, I actually have three. Okay. <clears throat> did, you, did you consider rail to the airport, did you consider the possible line into Adventureland uh, out here? Adventure District. Uh, yeah, and uh, let's see, and thirdly, have you talked to BNSF about their freight needs, which you hadn't at the last meeting? Uh, first, backwards. BNSF, we have a meeting May 10th to discuss that. That was the earliest meeting we could get with them. We, under, we know them well enough to know that the, that the models that we're going to put up here maintain their freight operations. And on May 10th, we're hopeful that they'll tell us of any future plans they might have for those freight operations. But we're confident that we will be able to work with them to make these models work, these, these, these three sites that we're going to show you. As far as going backwards, the Adventure District, we recognize that as one of those commuter rail lines going off to the east. I think that would more likely uh, act as an excursion train in the right. off-peak hours. Now, that doesn't mean that it won't be operating in the peak hours, but if it's in the peak hours, there's going to be a commuter rail line that can take you out there as easily as an excursion train. So I think it'll be very easily incorporated into that schedule that we showed you because the schedule, as, as you know, when you're coming into town at 8 a.m., there's a lot of cars on the road. If you come into town at 10 a.m., there's not nearly as many cars, and trains are the same way. People are trying to get here in the peak hours, get home in the peak hours. We think the excursion train is more off-peak. It's more 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. and, and then weekends. after and weekends. Yeah. And weekends. As far as the uh, commuter rail line to the airport or beyond, that was in the initial, uh, I think, 2006, six guideway study. At that time, the ridership didn't really justify the expense of commuter rail, so it was switched to bus rapid transit. We've shown that bus rapid transit line on here and have looked at the ridership of that, but we went ahead and included in the program the Edmund to Yukon line that would also essentially go by the airport. So we've accommodated that in this. And one caveat is we're trying to be as flexible as possible and accommodate as many modes as possible. You'll see as we go through the site layouts, there may be two or three options on how to accommodate some of those modes because things are going to change before this, this you project is built. route to Yukon could be used for the airport? It essentially goes down the, Re the Reno corridor would be one option. And that's, that's the subject of another study. All we've done is we've accommodated that route within the hub. How it gets there will be worked out under another study. That's not really the thing. Alan, that, that route's on our plan. Just make sure you don't migrate to our plan because that's our property, okay? Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, is there any talk about stations in, on any of these? Are there going to be stations between Edmond, Midwest City, Norman? Yeah, I'm sure there will be. Yeah. That's not really the focus of this study. Okay. Uh, what we're trying to do is figure out where that centerpiece hub is going to be. But I'm sure in future studies, when they start looking at commuter rail and how that really works, those stations will be a focus. Usually on a commuter rail line, you want a station about every five miles not much closer than that or affects the speed of the system. So within a 42-mile system, there's obviously that 
there will be more than you know, three or four stops along. Mark? I'm sorry, but I do take exception to calling the Adventure District line the excursion train. Yes, that term Adventure District connotates that, and yes, it would be an important link between Bricktown and the Adventure District. But that line would be an important line serving the northeast side of the city. And that may well be, and could well be, the, the first line that's built at a low cost price within the $10 million that's been allocated to us by the voters in the MAPS project, and which we've repeatedly heard from the council that we want to look at ways extending, extending the transit component in MAPS 3 as far as possible. So I really do take exception to perceiving that as some kind of one-off adventure district line. I, I, I'm concerned that you haven't looked at that and perhaps the airport line because the, 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 the um, fixed guideway study says so. And I want to hear that you consider that other lines that aren't in the fixed guideway study may well come in, not necessarily in the 2035 frame, time frame, but further on. I'm very concerned to hear that. That you future proof this system extensively. Good point. Did you get that, Jerry? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. let me, yeah, because there seems to be some confusion in several of those comments. The, the Yukon line out west does not go to the airport. There is a line that was originally the airport that when the Union Station and all that area was redone for the crosstown, the line across the river got disconnected, which was the extension of the Chickasaw line on to the south. That line now is able to be used on the Packingtown lead, which was upgraded. So essentially you can take a train immediately from a hub downtown, south across the river, over on the Packingtown lead, and that line goes within three quarters of a mile of the airport terminal. And that's not the Yukon line. And so I think it I mean, I'm in the same boat here that even though it's not in the fixed guideway study, the ridership's not there, I think looking 30 years into the future, if you assume we have a big rail transit system and it's a hit, at some point, whether the ridership for commuters is there, you could potentially be running a train, a DMU, back and forth down that line, which is a separate train, to the airport and back. And the adventure line also is not part of the Midwest City line other than that first <coughs> half a mile and it's its own separate line and so you have to you would have to make sure that you account for space in there for in addition to the other commuter train lines you have to make sure that those separate vehicles you've got room to park that's I mean I think that's the bottom line. I was saying that you need an platform those for routes for coming through at the moment needs to have some other lines on it right. so that you can say to us yes we can accommodate those as well as they come through yeah, that, I understand I, how you've modeled it out now, and that's fair enough. But uh, I'd like to see something beyond that. Well, fair enough. But if you go back to that very simple diagram, <clears throat> we're not trying to do a regional commuter rail study here. What we're trying to do is figure out is the hub in the right location to be the centerpiece of that. We want to be sure that the hub can handle yeah, it. Well, we understand, understand that the understand. area is there. Understood. Right, right. And what I'm, what I'm saying to you is we have lines going north, south, east, and west through the city. Now whether that line is the Edmond to Yukon line, or we call it the Edmond to Airport line, or the Edmond to Airport to Yukon line, we know it's going out west of the city. I mean, what we, I think what we're confident in is wherever those lines end up, they, we have enough room with the rail yard and the hub to accommodate the number of passengers and patrons that might be funneled into that hub area. That's on four lines, northeast, south, and west. What about northeast and southwest in addition? Those are different lines. Well, I know they're different well, lines, but the, the, the model is there. Has got the model's got the ridership in there. Okay, what? Well, fair enough. We'll 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 address those issues, and we'll we'll talk. We'll we'll address that in the next. Uh, uh, well, there's phase. a lot of ways you can calibrate the model. Right now, the model is. In, have our modeler here who can spend three hours talking about how this works, but it's essentially <laughs> capturing your ridership draw for the entire region. Right. And if you add another station, it's going to take riders away from one station and move it to another. The total probably won't change. Now, that may not be true over time because there, you might pick up more riders and provide more service, but you have to get that balance between what is the service cost and how many riders you're getting. And right now, the ridership model is telling us we have that balance. We can afford to do what we have based on the number of riders. If the number of riders goes down, we've got to cut something somewhere. If it goes up, you can start adding other lines.
lines. But that's exactly and, and that'll be a constant lines. variation as these studies move forward. I think all that every I think that those that want to hear it, all they want to know in the end right. is that we don't box ourselves into a side that those other potential lines or vehicles at some point wouldn't fit. I think that's right. all we're talking about. And I know we're just at the point where we're <clears throat> saying this is the site with the best connectivity and it looks like, you know, we're trying to find the one with the most area and from today going forward for the next month then, you're going to be looking at all the other details to well, make but, all that work. Right? Well, that's right. Yeah. But we've also said based on that ridership model and based on those numbers and an inflation factor of whatever you want to make it up to 600%, we've got platforms and buildings that we are accommodating. But that's just for the same number of trains with more cars. With the other lines, you have additional trains. Right. So either you're, that's you're, different. If you add more that's lines, different. your headways are getting closer together. Right. At some point, you get your headways right. get so close, right. you have to add another line. Right. That's right. That's, yeah, that's, right. that's, that's what, what, we'll, that's see, what we'll see. We'll what that does to us in a minute. Right. Yes. Sir. Would you explain to me what you all mean by commuter rail, commuter rail, high speed rail? I know what Amtrak is, and how those either add to or absorb existing buses, rubber tire vehicles that we have in Oklahoma City now. I, I have heard all these terms and I've traveled all over and ridden what I thought was one or the other, but I'd like to hear what you all are considering to be high-speed rail, commuter rail, and give me some examples of it. 